Hello everyone, my name is Ruben Inkalopov. I am a new economics corrector and I am happy to the, the this lecture. Our lecture will be in English with a simultaneous translation in, in, into Russian. So uh, please, please have to have in mind this uh, and click the proper icon. So there is a globe icon downstairs, uh, down on the right and the bottom of the Zoom window. And you can choose either Russian uh, language or if you don't need the translation, you can choose the English. Uh, this is option is uh, also available in Zoom mobile app uh, toolbar. We're also broadcasting this lecture uh, at the New Economic School YouTube channel in Russian and in English. So you can choose whatever language you prefer. Uh, this is the third lecture of the second uh, New Economic School guest lecture series by the world's leading researchers on the topics of their, of their interest and focus. So this lecture series is supported by the Russian Agricultural Bank, and we are really thankful to our partners for, for supporting us. Today, I'm really delighted to introduce Alex Savinsky, Arthur Okun, Professor of Economics and Yale University, and starting this year, also a visit us at the New Economic School. Alex is a, a world leading macroeconomist. Uh, uh, Professor Savinsky will be discussing on a specific topic about the economics of cryptocurrency. And we, as always, we want to encourage you to ask as many questions as possible to our speakers. So we'll be awarding a free two month subscription to Bookmate ebook services to the guest who will ask the speaker the most interesting question. Please post your questions in the chats, uh, both in Zoom and in YouTube. And the best question will be raised during the QA uh, question session. Glad to see that we already have such a large audience today and we would like to know where you're actually joining us from. So from, since usually we have audience from all over the world, we really want to know uh, where you're coming from. So the link to the poll should appear in the chat now and there you can basically tell us where you're coming from and which country. I will take a look at the map uh, showing the distribution of, the, of our uh, later during uh, in between lecture and the Q&A session. And now it's my pleasure to give the floor to Professor Alex Zivinsky. Alex, the floor is yours. All organizations don't need to for the that are coming from. There is a special like, link. Please go there, put your, uh, your city. That's, uh, that will allow us then to post it uh, and show it on the map. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Yenik Alopov. Uh, thank you to the New Economic School for inviting me and for hosting this lecture. It's much uh, my pleasure to talk about uh, this topic. It's interesting, it's topical, and uh, it's timely, I think. So what I'm going to talk today is I'm going to try to demystify or to provide some facts about economics of cryptocurrencies. And uh, first and foremost, I just want to say that uh, this work is based on my joint work with uh, two of my colleagues. Uh, one is Professor Yukon Du, who is a professor of finance at the University of Rochester at the Simon School of Business. And the second is uh, Professor Shi Wu, who is a professor of accounting at Berkeley Ha School. And uh, my presentation today is going to be based on two uh, papers that uh, are um, forthcoming. So the first one is uh, my work on the risk and returns of cryptocurrency, which is forthcoming in the review of financial studies. And the second one is risk and returns of cryptocurrency, which is uh, just got accepted 
<clears throat> at the Journal of uh, Finance. So what I want to talk today about is I want to try to understand cryptocurrencies. And I want to understand cryptocurrencies from the point of view of asset pricing. So why should we care about the asset pricing point of view? Well, at the very simple level, just think about the financial markets, um, the people who try to price these assets to find the value of these assets, assigning some value of them by trading. Okay, so an asset pricing allows you to gather, if you want, the wisdom and the information of the crowds, information of different people uh, about these assets and incorporate them in the price of this asset. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a finance or asset price in view on cryptocurrencies. And through that lens, I will try to understand what cryptocurrencies are. Well, I just want to make a disclaimer that uh, since this is a very, again, uh, interesting and hot topic and this topic is about finance, that please don't take anything here as an investment advice but just uh, join me in trying to understand uh, cryptocurrencies. All right, so before we even start analyzing cryptocurrencies, let's just do something relatively simple. Or maybe it's not that simple, but let's try to construct an index of cryptocurrencies. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, let's take 1800 currencies. So these are the largest cryptocurrencies by capitalization. Let's try to put them together and make an index that is representative of the uh, cryptocurrencies overall. Not just the question of Bitcoin or Ethereum or the Dogecoin, but cryptocurrencies as a market. So we call the index the coin market or CMC. And it's going to comprise 1,800 currencies. Well, uh, let's have an arbitrary cutoff of what large may be. And large may be, uh, say, the cryptocurrencies with capitalization of more than $1 million. So the question is, how good is the data? How good is the data, especially for relatively smaller coins? Well, and... Uh, I can tell you that uh, the data since the first draft of this paper that we had in 2018 of these papers has improved tremendously. So the data, the reliability of it, the availability of the data has made tremendous strides and became maybe not at the same level as it is for other asset classes, but certainly it's widely available. One could find reputable and uh, high quality data providers and one can try to understand and put together based on uh, this reasonably high quality data. All right, so this is how uh, the coin market uh, looks like uh, versus Bitcoin. So this is a very simple, very simple graph. And this graph says, what would you, what would you make if you just put $1 of investment in 2014? What would you make up to now? So the blue line is the coin market index, the index of 1800 coins that uh, I have created. And the red line is the, uh, the graph for the price of, of Bitcoin. Okay, so uh, it's hard to zoom in, or maybe especially at this uh, larger, uh, larger values, but you can see that while coin market is moving similarly, to the price of the price of the coin market moving similarly to the price of Bitcoin, they still are rather distinct. And if you zoom in, if you're able to zoom in, you will see that actually uh, they differ. So coin market is not just Bitcoin. It's much broader than Bitcoin or five or 10 of the largest cryptocurrencies. All right, so let's first establish some of the basic facts about cryptocurrencies. Well, and uh, let's uh, start with the thing which is the first thing that comes to, the, to mind if you think about finance or if you think about asset pricing. And this first thing is, what is return? 
on cryptocurrency. So here I'm going to calculate weekly return. So how much money, if you want, you can make within a given week. And on average, the mean return on uh, cryptocurrencies is about 225, 2.25%. And this is since 2014. So the numbers change slightly if you look at different time periods. But uh, if you look at the average return since 2014, it's 2.25% per week. This is just giant numbers. For example, for stocks, for the US stocks, the corresponding number is just 0.23%. Okay, but again, we're looking from the point of view of finance. And what we care is not just the returns, but what we care also is the risk inherent in investing in this asset. Well, how do we measure risk? Well, one measure of risk is the volatility of returns. Yes, we can measure them by standard deviation. And the volatility of uh, the coin market, the volatility of the coin market is 12.89%. So which is also significantly larger than that of stocks, which is just 2.11%. So we have the return, we have the volatility. Let's try to put them together. So how do we put them together? Well, there is a handy ratio which is the risk return ratio or return to risk ratio or other, and it's called the sharp ratio. Well, and the sharp ratio is exactly return divided by volatility of investment. And the return to volatility ratio is 0.17 at the weekly level. And you can compare that to stocks and it's 0.11. If you compound it at the yearly level, you'll get 1.26 sharp ratio for the coin market and 0.79 sharp ratio for stocks. So what does this mean? And I'm going to try to organize the stock in trying to give you some facts about cryptocurrencies as, as an asset. And this leads me to fact number one. And fact number one is the following, that while the returns of cryptocurrencies are very high, the volatility is also very high. In fact, the both the return and the risk of cryptocurrencies are an order of magnitude higher than that of stocks. However, if we look at what an investor would care about, the risk return trade off as measured by sharp ratio, both stocks and bond, the stocks and cryptocurrencies, they don't have this amazingly different uh, sharp ratios. Sure, they're different, but they're more comparable than just looking at the returns or just looking at volatility would suggest. All right, so that's the first question. It's the basic facts about uh, the risk return trade-off of cryptocurrencies. Now let us ask what cryptocurrencies are. And there are many different narratives about cryptocurrencies. There are many different ways people think about cryptocurrencies. But let me try to maybe talk about four of the most important um, themes that are available in terms of trying to understand what cryptocurrencies potentially may be. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is that cryptocurrency is just a currency. So you can think about cryptocurrency as an alternative to say US dollar or to ruble or to yuan or to any other or of the traditional, traditional currencies. Well, you can think about cryptocurrency as a commodity, maybe a precious metal commodity. For example, many people think that cryptocurrency is digital equivalent of gold. So maybe it's a digital gold. Maybe it's digital gold. Well, maybe cryptocurrency is a bet on the future of technology embedded in blockchain. So think about, for example, the internet revolution. Who would have guessed that a bookseller out of Seattle would be a company that changes so many industries? So maybe cryptocurrencies 
if their assets just represent a particular bet or maybe very wide bet on the future of blockchain technology. Well, maybe cryptocurrency is an inflation or macroeconomic hedge. For many developing economies, for many emerging market economies, maybe cryptocurrency represent a better reserve uh, currency or a better um, insurance against, say, bad economic policy of the local governments. Maybe it's even an insurance or a hedge against bad monetary policy on the global scale. Maybe it's a bet against uh, the inflationary pressures which are coming to the forefront of the economic agenda as we speak now. So there are all these narratives <clears throat> and what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to use asset pricing, use finance to tell us and to tell me as a researcher of what cryptocurrencies are in the view of this information that is available on the market, which is widely dispersed. Different people have different opinions, different knowledge, different pieces of knowledge. But then it all is collapsed or all is concentrated in one asset price. So does currency behave, does, do cryptocurrencies behave like currencies? So maybe that's one um, example of why they may be, may be currencies. Does cryptocurrency behave like gold? Does cryptocurrency behave like uh, a broad set of equity markets? Does cryptocurrency behave as a hedge against inflation? So that's exactly what I'm going to do. And how I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this in the following, the following way. So I'm going to look at each of these categories one by one. And I'm going to ask uh, the question at the very simple level of whether cryptocurrencies, whether the prices of cryptocurrencies are driven by similar factors as the prices of currencies, gold, um, equities, and other, other variables. So let's start with currency. So let's see whether cryptocurrencies co-move or move together with the usual currencies. So for example, do they move together with Australian dollar, with Canadian dollar, with Euro, with Singaporean dollar, or with UK pound? So why did they choose this currency? We have done actually for many more currencies in our research. But uh, Australian and Canadian dollars are heavily resourced, or Australia and Canada, heavily resource-based economies. Euro and UK pound are alternative large uh, reserve currencies in the world. Singaporean dollar is just one example of a freely traded um, uh, Asian uh, economy with a significant exposure to China. So why not US dollar? Well, the answer is somewhat obvious because we are denominating Bitcoins in dollars. So it's exchange rate, if you wish, of crypto, cryptocurrency market or coin market or Bitcoin, if you want to, two dollars. Okay, so that's the very simple level. Do they co-move? Do cryptocurrencies, does a cryptocurrency market does it co-move together with the traditional currencies? Well, it's a very simple way how to approach this question. We can approach this question at a much deeper level. We can, in fact, take the research on the currencies, as I, I exemplified by this very well-known paper by Lastik, Rosalov, and Berdelhan, and take the factors that they find determine the movements of the currencies and say whether those factors determine the prices of cryptocurrencies. Okay, and the answer is no. Cryptocurrencies behave in either the simple or in this more sophisticated way. They behave differently from the normal currencies or the traditional currencies, if you wish. So let's, uh, let's move on to the next question. Is cryptocurrency market or does cryptocurrency market behave similarly 
two precious metal commodities. So uh, this narrative of digital gold, do we have similar movement or similar factors that determine the prices of precious metal commodities? And we take gold, platinum, and silver, and we have done many more in our research. And the answer is that, again, there is no statistically significant exposure to precious metal commodities. So in this sense, cryptocurrencies are not digital gold. So the same factors that price cryptocurrencies are not the factors that are pricing um, the precious metal commodities. All right, so let's move to the next question. Well, maybe it's a bet on the future of technology. So is this a very precise technology, blockchain technology, how to bet it or how to, how to bet on it, how to understand it? We don't know. So however, what we can ask is the following question. Whether the same factors that price equity market that determine the prices of the equities of the stocks, whether they play a role in determining the prices of cryptocurrencies. Well, how would we go about this? Well, the large body of research in finance is designed to build factor models. So what are the factor models? The factor models is, if you want to think about this in a very simple, uh, very simple terms, are the summary of different factors, the main elements that drive the prices of uh, equities. So here, what we do is we have looked at the most common equity pricing models. So the most famous one of them is the capital asset pricing model, which says how each individual stock behaves in relationship to the overall equity market, so S&P 500 or any other uh, broad index. We take Pharma French, uh, very well known or widely used uh, equity, equity pricing model, which has three factors, but we we'll also look at the four factors, five factors, six factor models, and the five and six factor models are found to work reasonably well in determining the equity price, actually very well. In fact. We find that the cryptocurrency markets are not priced by any of the factors that price equities, neither the international equities nor the US equities. Okay, so this is relatively, relatively simple, relatively straightforward to do. Let's do something more sophisticated. And something more sophisticated will be an exercise of the following sort. So let's take the so-called factor zoo. So what's a factor zoo? So it's my uh, colleague at uh, Yale School of Management, Stefano Giglio, has written this uh, relatively recent well-known paper where he and co-authors uh, did the fall. They said, well, let's take all of the research in finance, high quality research in finance, and let's determine what they have found in terms of what predicts returns, what factors predict returns, predict the stock returns. So it turns out that this factor zoo is actually relatively large and the factor zoo has about 155 factors. So this, so you can think about this 155 factors as 155 uh, predictors or 155 strategies that are found to work in predicting the stock market. So and that's, cool. that's why it's called factor zoo because you know, there are different animals if you wish uh, the different types of the strategies that work in predicting the behavior of the stock market. It actually turns out that none of them, none of the factor zoo strategies work in, um, in determining the prices of the cryptocurrencies. So it's not a bet on the future of technology. What about macro? 
What about the macro factors? Is it a hedge? Is, at, is a cryptocurrency, is cryptocurrency market an insurance against, say, the bad economic policy or it's insurance against the future macro shocks? Uh, so the answer is also no. And here we take a variety of macro factors. We have, in fact, we have taken pretty much all of the known uh, factors that exist in the, in the asset price and literature. But let me just give you some examples. For example, we take um, durable and non-durable consumption growth. We take industrial production growth. We take personal income growth, many other things as well. But there is no exposure of cryptocurrency markets to any of these factors. And I mean, statistically significant exposure. What about inflation? So many people think that uh, the reason why Bitcoin and many other currencies, uh, cryptocurrencies exist, are the large ones, are because they provide uh, a hedge against future inflation. And the, and the idea goes as follows, that it's hard to inflate, it's hard to print more of the uh, Bitcoin and uh, hence, unlike the dollars, the unlimited supply, so the inflation is less likely or actually unlikely for the cryptocurrencies with the limited supply. So what we find is we find no significant exposure to either inflation or to inflationary expectations of cryptocurrencies. Okay, so this brings me to fact number two. And the fact number two, it's, uh, it's a negative finding. I think it's a negative in the, in the right way finding. So it says that cryptocurrencies are driven, are determined by different factors than standard assets. So here you can pause and tell me, well, you just tell me that all of this, uh, the cryptocurrencies just don't correlate with anything. So these are just a bunch of negative things. No, 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 no. So what can cryptocurrencies be used for then? Well, the first answer is something very simple, but again, it comes to the essence of what finance and what the financial markets are. If you have an asset which is determined, the price of which is determined by different factors than the prices of other assets, then this asset actually is great because you can diversify your portfolio. And what does diversification mean? Well, diversification means that basically it's an old proverb, don't put all of your eggs in one basket because you know, if you break it, all of your eggs are gonna be broken. So diversification is exactly this idea is that what you wanna do is you wanna put your wealth in different baskets. Okay. And if you have an asset that moves differently from gold, if you have assets that move, moves differently from stocks, have an asset that moves differently from uh, the macroeconomic shocks, then this asset is a valuable part of your portfolio. Well, the question is how much should you, call, should you hold? And here I'm gonna say, well, the circumstances are different, depends on many things, depends on the amount of your wealth, on how risk averse you are, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing we have done is we have done the so-called black Litterman test or black, black Litterman uh, allocation uh, method. And it essentially does the following. It says, given all of the known asset classes, equities, currencies, and so on and so on, given their properties of how they move and given cryptocurrencies, how much of it you should hold in your portfolio depending on your beliefs. Whether you believe that the cryptocurrency market is going to continue its spectacular rise the way it has been doing up to now, whether it's going to stay flat, whether it's going to go down, it's going to do say half or a third as well as it has done before. And Black Litterman test allows you, given the behavior of other assets, given your beliefs or your outlook about a given asset class, it tells you how much you should hold as a part of your portfolio. 
You can find the calculations in, in the paper. <clears throat> okay. But then you can tell me, just wait a second. There are many other things which are uh, pretty random. So you, there's this whole cryptocurrency stuff just looks like random noise, just moves up and down. You know, there is no correlation with any of the other as known assets. So the question is whether cryptocurrency market prices and the returns of cryptocurrencies, whether they are just random noise. Okay, and that's what I'm going to try to, to answer next. So let me first start with uh, the theory of uh, asset pricing, in particular, applied to cryptocurrencies. And again, guided by the theories, I'm going to try to see, I'm going to try to empirically test whether some of the factors identified in the asset pricing theory, crypto asset pricing theory, whether indeed they are important, whether they indeed drive the prices of cryptocurrencies. So I'm going to go through some major um, strands of theory that determine which are the factors or which are the elements which are important for pricing uh, cryptocurrencies. So it turns out that, uh, in fact, the theoretical work on cryptocurrencies is rather well developed. Actually, a number of uh, excellent or exceptional papers on this topic and it's very interesting from the theoretical point of view. So here, I'm actually also a macro theorist. I mean, first and foremost, a macro theorist. But here, I'm actually going to wear a different hat. I'm going to wear a finance hat, where I'm going to be looking at the theories as a guide. And I'm going to be seeing whether these theories have the empirical counterpart to test these theories, if you, if you wish. So the first set of theories, so these are, these are the well-known papers on the, on the topic, they essentially say the following. The network factors are the factors that determine the prices of cryptocurrencies. So what does this mean? So perhaps the easiest way to think about this is to think about a common social network, say Facebook. So why would you want to join, say, Facebook as opposed to I don't know, TikTok? Well, it depends on how many other people are the part of this network. The more people are there, the better it is for you to be a part of this network because more of your friends are going to be there. The more celebrities are going to be there, the more news are going to be there, and so on and so on. So there is a value in network. And actually, that's exactly the way how people, in fact, value many of the internet companies or many of the social networks is to look at this network factors at the user base at the projected user base, and so on and so on. So the same idea holds also for cryptocurrencies. So what it means is that think about, for example, Bitcoin, the more places accept Bitcoin, the more users want to join it. And the, uh, these things reinforce each other. So there is a value in a large network. The more acceptable it becomes, the more valuable it becomes. So you can think of, of uh, the size of the network, the acceptability, the wideness of use as a measure of value, a measure of utility for the consumers, if you wish. So let's uh, try to measure this. So, uh, well, so I'll start with testing network factors. And what you can do is, in fact, we have done many, many more detailed things in, in our research. But for example, you can construct some measure of this network. For example, you can construct the number of the wallet users. So the, the number of the wallets that are available for, uh, for cryptocurrencies, for Bitcoin, for example. The number of active addresses, the number of transactions the number of transactions which are done for payments of goods and services. And it turns out that the coin market returns are indeed <coughs> positively correlated with network factors. So it means that indeed the prices are higher for those currencies which have bigger networks so during the times when the network growth is faster or higher. 
This is not only true about the contemporaneous correlation today on today, it's also true dynamically. Because remember, the nature of the prices is that they not only value an asset today, but they in fact give you an estimate of the value of the asset in the future as well. So it turns out that the crypto prices are indeed forward-looking and they indeed contain information about the adoption, about the wide use of the uh, network in a given crypto. So another way to say it is that the high coin market returns, so when the returns are high, they predict the larger number of future users or future users and users as well. <clears throat> All right, so this is the first big chunk of the theoretical work. It's about if you want the value or the demand or the utility of the cryptocurrencies. The second part are the so-called production factors. So what are the production factors? And again, so there is a well-developed theory here as well. You've heard probably, all of you have heard about mining. So what's, what's mining? Mining is a way how to verify different transactions that are done, say on the Bitcoin network, uh, or to enforce some of the things on other coins. But um, let's not go into the mathematical, cryptographic, technical details of how exactly mining is done. I'm gonna give you a little cheat sheet I'm going to give you a little simple rule of how to think about <coughs> the costs of crypto mining. Well, the cost of crypto mining fundamentally come down to two things. The first is how fast your computer is, the raw computing power. So if you put many more of the, say, the graphic cards that process very efficiently, this uh, cryptographic puzzles, the more uh, Bitcoins you can mine. And the second one, to run those uh, uh, graphic cards or specialized mining software and mining hardware, you need electricity. So uh, the production factors are roughly the computing power that is needed times the electricity consumption that is used in production. Uh, of, uh, of mining, production of coins, if you wish. Well, how to test this? Well, let's first test electricity costs. So notice that electricity costs are actually rather difficult to measure because electricity is very local. So we do many, many different uh, proxies and uh, studies for the prices, local price of electricity as they may matter for cryptocurrencies. But for example, we'll look at the prices and uh, overall generation of electricity in both the US and China. Why China? Because many of the mining farms are in China. In Sichuan, the Sichuan province of China, where there are some of the largest mining farms. So then proxies for computing power are also difficult. And here we do a variety of things. Let me just uh, name some of them. For example, one could look at the stock prices of the equipment manufacturers. For example, NVIDIA, the uh, company that produces video cards that are used for uh, Bitcoin mining or cryptocurrency mining, or for the more specialized semiconductor chips like the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company and many others. Or we have constructed also the measures of the costs of the specialized equipment needed to mine cryptocurrencies. We we'll also have done other stuff. For example, we uh, tested uh, the profitability of miners, so proxies of profitability of miners. But unlike the network factors, we actually do not, surprisingly to us, in fact, we did not find that the production factors, the mining factors, in fact, have a sizable impact on statistically sizable impact on pricing of cryptocurrencies. So this brings me to fact number three, is that cryptocurrencies consistently with theory are driven by demand. So that is by utility or the value of cryptocurrency embedded in their network. But 
surprisingly, not by the supply or production considerations. Okay. So, uh, so far I have, uh, I have talked about the factors that uh, determine the price of cryptocurrencies. Now let me ask a somewhat more subtle question, which is, are the returns of cryptocurrencies, are they predictable? Okay. And not just the predictability in uh, the sense of being an oracle, but are the other things which work for other asset classes, whether the same predictors or the same types of predictors that work for other asset classes, whether they indeed are useful for predicting the prices of cryptocurrencies. That is, I'm gonna construct a series of crypto characteristics which have been used in other asset classes, which are parallel to other asset classes that may or may not be useful for predicting the prices of uh, cryptocurrencies. <clears throat> All right, so now again, let me go back to, to theory. So the, uh, the theory roughly tells us that one of the most important predictors of returns is momentum. In fact, momentum, or in simple words, what goes up continues to go up. The momentum turns out is present in a variety of other asset classes, currencies, commodities, equities. So probably one of the most well-known papers is the paper by, again, my colleague at, uh, at Yale, Toby Moskowitz, who documents momentum in a variety of asset classes and who also builds some of the theories of momentum. I'm gonna take some of the cryptocurrency pricing theories and I'm gonna see, I'm gonna test them whether there is momentum in cryptocurrency pricing. So uh, a great paper by Conley and Wang argue that the momentum may arise because, again, coming back to the question of this network value, that users, the people who buy, say, cryptocurrency now, they don't fully internalize the possible speed of adoption. They don't possibly, they don't fully internalize how fast this additional benefit of a larger network is gonna be used for the future users or gonna be useful for the future users. So it only is incorporated slowly and hence this is gonna generate momentum. And what we indeed find is that indeed consistent with other asset classes and consistent with the theories, there is statistically significant evidence of cryptocurrency momentum at different horizons. Okay. So another thing which actually turns out to predict returns is uh, investor attention. So whether investors pay attention to cryptocurrency, how much they pay attention. Again, this is consistent with Sokin and Sean's work. And uh, uh, they talk about different types of attention, the positive and the negative attention. So here, again, we construct a wide variety of tests. In particular, we con uh, construct Google searches for different cryptocurrencies. We construct uh, Twitter searches. We uh, you know, many, many, many other things to measure the attention paid for uh, paid to cryptocurrencies. And in particular, we find strong evidence for both and separately positive and negative attention. Moreover, attention and momentum turn out to be different. And this is actually not the case in many other asset classes where momentum and attention typically go hand in hand. All right, so you can say, well, momentum works, attention works. What does not work? What does not work for predicting returns that works for other asset classes? Well, in the equity markets, 
one of the things that actually tend to work is some measure of the fundamental to market ratio. So which is sometimes dividend to price ratio or earnings to price ratio. So the uh, Bob Schiller, so another of my colleagues essentially got the Nobel Prize for showing how similar measures indeed predict um, the equity market. So it turns out that this is not the case for the cryptocurrency market. So while there is a contemporaneous uh, correlation, contemporaneous determination of the price by the network factors or the user value factors, uh, it turns out that this ratios like uh, value, to value to market or fundamental to market ratios actually do not predict returns. And this was actually surprising to us. And we have looked at a variety of measures uh, like this. So this brings me to effect number five, that cryptocurrency market returns can be predicted by cryptocurrency momentum and cryptocurrency investor attention, but not by the cryptocurrency uh, price to earning ratio, if you want. Uh, let me give you a couple of other interesting, interesting facts that we, that we found here before I go to the more detailed examination of the cryptocurrency market in individual coins. So what about regulations? So my own personal opinion on regulations, which some people think are going to destroy the cryptocurrency market, are actually good for the cryptocurrency market. Because the more regulations there are, the more normal that asset class is. So what we do is we use an index created by these folks who look at the re regulatory or regulative uh, events and we test whether cryptocurrency returns react to this regulatory events. Actually, it turns out that uh, they react to negative regulatory events, but not to the positive ones. I think it's an interesting, interesting fact. What about speculative interests? So many people just think that cryptocurrencies are just all about speculation and the prices are driven by the behavior of uh, speculators or to a large extent driven by the behavior of speculators. So it turns out, and we do so, one could construct a measure of the, the share of the speculators in the cryptocurrency market. However, this share of the cryptocurrency speculators does not predict the future returns. However, high returns predict that there are going to be more speculators in the future. But this is not useful for predicting returns. Another massive thing we have done is to look at the cryptocurrency sentiment. So we build our own uh, uh, code of, uh, of uh, words and uh, trained the artificial network to recognize the sentiment that is inherent in tweets and in discussion on the boards for cryptocurrencies. And it actually turns out that sentiment is useful for predicting cryptocurrency returns and it moves together with the cryptocurrencies. And it's somewhat distinct from both investor attention and, and momentum. So again, this brings the question of this more demand-like factors or network-like factors are useful for determining the prices of uh, cryptocurrencies. Some people think that cryptocurrency is also like a beauty contest. So what's a beauty contest? Well, imagine uh, a group of people and us trying to find who is the most beautiful person say, at a party. Well, people differ in terms of the concept of beauty. In fact, the idea of stock market as a beauty contest is due to Keynes, in fact. So, and Keynes described, I think Keynes described actually, in fact, like this. So rather than just me saying, well, this person is the most beautiful person in the world or in this room, what I have to guess is not only who I think the most beautiful person is, but what other people think who the most beautiful people are. So not only I have to form an opinion about who the most beautiful person is, but also about the beliefs of the beliefs of the beliefs of the beliefs and so on of other folks. It turns out you can uh, create measures and indices of such disagreement or indices of this dispersion of beliefs, but it turns out that they do not predict returns, unlike, say, other asset, uh, other asset classes.
So it's not a beauty context, at, at least in terms of predicting returns. All right, so, so far, I have deliberately talked about the coin market. So the coin market as a cryptocurrency market overall. But an interesting question also is to zoom in at the level of individual coins. How and what can determine the prices of individual coins? That's, not going to, that's what I'm going to do next. Well, as everything we do, we try to be comprehensive and systematic. And what we're going to do is we're going to create an equivalent of the factor zoo. So we're going to take everything that worked for equities. We actually done a bunch of other S classes as well, but let's start with equities. Let's take everything that worked in equities for predicting the returns on equities. Let's try to create their cryptocurrency market counterparts. Not all of them can be done because accounting information is uh, not systematically available. So my co-author, Shi Wu, works on trying to bridge this gap in her own work. But uh, for everything for which market information is available, we actually created the equivalent of cryptocurrency market zoo. The size, momentum, value, volume, liquidity, volatility, all kinds of things that have been found to predict equity returns. We have their cryptocurrency market counterparts. And it turns out that 10 of such strategies or tens of such factors, if you want predictors, indeed predict returns. Okay. However, it's not only interesting to find these predictors, but the name of the game, certainly in other asset classes, is to see whether a small number of factors determine the prices of individual coins, rather than say 10 factor model, 10 factors that predict them. So it turns out that a three factor model, just three factors, are able to predict returns systematically on individual coins. So the first is the coin market factor. The prices of individual coins or a price of an individual coin is higher when the cryptocurrency market is higher. The, uh, the, coin, the, the momentum factor, so when the momentum uh, in a given coin is higher, the coin is going to be priced higher. There's a little typo here, so it should be momentum. And when the coin is smaller, there is a premium for that coin. So this is similar in the spirit to the three-factor Fama French model that I have described to you for the equity market, but it works for the cryptocurrency market. A small number of factors predict the or give the price of each individual coin. Okay. So that's, uh, that's, my next, uh, that's my next fact, that one can write down a small factor model, a small number of factors that explain the cross-section, the behavior of individual uh, coin, uh, coin returns. Well, now in the, in the interest of the last you know, five minutes of time, again, I want to investigate the mechanism behind the momentum and behind the size factor. Why is it the case that the smaller coins on average have higher returns. There's a specific sense when I mean on average. Well, it turns out that size consistently actually with a variety of theories is a proxy for liquidity. It turns out that the small coins have lower prices because they are more illiquid. It's more difficult to sell them than large coins. And hence on average, they uh, tend to have higher returns to compensate for this uh, risks of not being able to sell them when you want to sell them. When we look at the time series and the behavior over time, it turns out that the size premium, how much the small coins are overpriced, it's larger when the market is more volatile. Again, it's uh, more difficult to sell the, the, um, the coins quickly when there is more, more volatility. Uh, we created an index of arbitrage costs, how difficult it is to 
uh, arbitrage away or to reduce this price discrepancy. If something is overpriced, obviously money are going to flow into the, those assets and this overpricing is going to disappear. So we're creating an index of the cost of arbitrage and we find that it's those coins which are difficult to arbitrage are on average, on average have higher returns. However, the size is not about the lottery. It's not about the skewness of the returns. It's not about the fact that, you know, some of the small coins are going to massively maybe shoot in the future. And it turns out it's not the lottery effect that is in play. The second explanation for size is the capital gain versus convenience yield. And what this means is you can think about any price of any asset as consistent of two components. The first is how much value it gives you today. Think about the, the house, the bigger house, the more beautiful house and better neighborhood gives you more value today. And the second part of the value of the asset is how much a capital gain it's gonna give you in the future. Well, it turns out that uh, consistently again with the theory, we find that the size premium again is consistent with this idea that it's a premium that's going to give you, uh, you know, a larger capital gain in the future. And hence, it's relatively uh, large when the demand for the value, demand for the convenience yield uh, is high. So the same with momentum. So the theory of the momentum is often built either on the behavioral economics foundation or on the foundation of information processing. And actually, uh, some of, so, sometimes they, they coincide. And the momentum phenomenon at the, broad, at the broad level is consistent with one of the two things. It's either with underreaction, it takes time for information to get incorporated in prices, or overreaction. So you have uh, a very quick reaction and then you have a reversal of the prices. And here we find strong evidence against underreaction. Okay, and this is very different in uh, contrast to say equity. So in fact, momentum is large among large coins. So the coins where information is very quickly incorporated in or should be more quickly incorporated than among the small coins, which have less coverage, less well-known, and so on. However, we find strong evidence for the overreaction channel. Okay? And uh, uh, in fact, we find the momentum is strong among the high attention coins. And this is again consistent with a number of recent theories of momentum or, or as overreaction. Okay, so let me, uh, this, so this, this brings me to, to another fact that the cross-sectional um, factors and the cross-sectional behavior of cryptocurrencies is in fact similar, broadly similar with certainly some important exception, exceptions to those of the equities or other asset class. And look at currencies and, and so on. So this is my uh, penultimate fact. And the last fact I'm gonna just assert with it because we actually are doing uh, and planning to do some of the work on this now and when we think about the cryptocurrency, I want to emphasize that it's not just about currencies. It's about a bunch of boring, but perhaps very important technologies that may change the boring industries like logistics or agriculture. And uh, there is in fact value and interesting behavior of those industries. And here what I plot is the digital network index versus the coin market index. And uh, if I had more time, I would be very happy to talk about the behavior of each individual sectors and so on of the cryptocurrency market. All right, so let me then uh, conclude and maybe just give you a little bit of my own personal take on, on all of this. So I started this uh, uh, research with uh, uh, Yukon and Xi in, in 2018 when uh, cryptocurrencies were just thought as a complete you know, fluke or something which is almost embarrassing to, to look at. Um, and you know some of this uh, opinion perhaps still exists, but one uh, cannot deny that cryptocurrencies certainly came of age or maybe are coming of age. So the, both the research in terms of the theory, empirics, the data, the regulatory framework is much, much more developed around the cryptocurrencies. And it's an exciting topic of both research and uh, practice. 
And what I'm emphasizing here, even though I'm, I'm a, a macro theorist to a large extent as well, that asset pricing and the tools of finance can and should be used to understand the nature of uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. So let me just stop on this, stop sharing my screen and uh, take some of the questions. Great. Uh, so thanks uh, a lot uh, for a wonderful lecture. And uh, first, let's uh, briefly, uh, as a icebreaker, uh, look at the map to see cities and countries where audience is, uh, is, uh, is located out of curiosity before moving to the questions. And that gives you audience a little bit more time to actually ask questions. So uh, okay, great. So again, we have a very, very dispersed um, audience uh, that uh, coming from like uh, all over Russia, but uh, really way more than that. Uh, and uh, I guess like the, the, the the most eastern point that I see is Vietnam, <laughs> at least on this on on, on this map. Uh, it's all over all over only like the former Soviet Republic, but basically all all, all over Europe, uh, and uh, uh, from oh, what I see, yeah, that's uh, from United Arab Emirates, Egypt. Uh, uh, Israel to Turkey, so like, like Asian Asian continent is also fully covered. Um, uh, Canary Islands, is a, somebody has a nice, <laughs> nice, nice time, and all, all over US as well. So really, it's now like a full well, uh, coverage, um, uh, and yes, and, and including people from Africa also. Guys, yeah, yeah. So obviously, the question of crypt cryptocurrencies is <laughs> is uh, currently came of age at least as a, as a question everyone is interested in. So let me ask uh, some questions that uh, people are asking cats and then uh, and I, uh, from the start, I want to apologize to people uh, since we have already like 140 questions, I will clearly not be able to ask all the questions. I will already make it like a try to selectively and group them. So apologies for everyone in particular. But there is a group of questions that is asking about um, digital currencies that are being current now introduced by central banks. So, and the question is like how they related to uh, crypt uh, cryptocurrencies, will they affect the pricing of the cryptocurrencies? Like, and um, in general, how, what, how different these two types of currencies are. So this is, these are questions that we get from, from that. A very natural question to ask. Uh, and this is actually also something that worries me and interests me a little bit less than a macro, macro economist. And the way at least I think about this is the following. There is a fantastic book, which I recommend to everybody. It's written in 1913 by the fellow named William Spring. It's the history of the national banking era in the United States. And it's essentially a history of banking prior to the existence of the Federal Reserve. And one thing that you learn from uh, that, uh, that book, well, one thing you learn is uh, the reasons for the crisis, but the second thing you learn is that, in fact, in the US, there were many monies, there were many individual currencies issued by the banks. And uh, in the end, you know, the US dollar uh, became to, uh, to reign supreme, but we still have a bunch of other currencies uh, in the world. So certainly the currencies which are going to be introduced by the central banks are going to affect the cryptocurrencies which have a role of traditional currencies. So perhaps Bitcoin looks more like a traditional currency, but there are many, many other cryptocurrencies, the role of which are perhaps very removed from the traditional roles of money as a medium of exchange, as a unit of account, as a store of value. And that's, I think, where the most interesting, the most exciting applications of cryptocurrencies are from my point of view. So will we be able to write a smart contracts which will automatically execute for some of the things which are much complicated, very complicated now, I suppose buying a house or you know, um, getting citizenship or many other things. So the applications uh, of cryptocurrencies are something that I think are much more exciting than the day-to-day -day questions of how the central banks and whether the central banks are going to have uh, their own currency. Certainly, if I were um, the uh, 
the creator of one of the digital currencies, the primary role of which is say being a stable coin. I'd be very worried about being dominated, being driven out of market by the, uh, the traditional uh, digital currencies, if you wish. But I'm uh, less worried for other applications of the cryptocurrencies uh, on the stock. Yeah, okay. So there are uh, also kind of uh, several questions that broadly related to the following issue me uh, of uh, the relationship in, between cryptocurrencies and envi environmental factors. So mining is very, very resource intensive in electricity and um, clearly has a very big environmental impact. And it uh, looks like both uh, the ESG policies and apparently policies towards Bitcoin and sentiment towards Bitcoin, they are very much um, kind of uh, affected by the sentiments of the general public. And they seem to be anti-correlated <laughs> with the environmental and cryptocurrencies. So what's your take on, on this relationship between un environmental factors and cryptocurrencies? It's uh, actually another great question. It's actually something that moves the markets. You know, today's announcement of uh, Tesla not being uh, accepting the crypto, the Bitcoin as uh, as a payment method, something that moved the price of Bitcoin today. So um, I think environmental issues are very important. In fact, a large part of my work is about the optimal policy with respect to the climate change. So environmental concerns are important, but it's also relatively straightforward to understand how to how they can be uh, how they can be resolved. For example. You know, uh, the, some of the cryptocurrencies or some of the miners could buy the carbon offsets or they can be forced to, to do so by the markets. If you are perceived as environmentally unfriendly, then the markets will tell you, hey, it's minus 15% of your value. So 15% of the value of the Bitcoin or whatever was the fall uh, on the announcement of the Tesla, it's a lot of money. You can buy a lot of carbon permits for it to offset quite a lot of, uh, of the environmental damage. The question is whether the markets will be able to force the companies, the miners, the users to do so. It's actually not clear. And that's, that's another area where I, in fact, welcome uh, regulations and welcome, in fact, taxation. Because if this is something which is going to generate sizable environmental impact, we all know how to solve this. It's a Pigouvian tax that brings the values to society, to the values of the individual uh, market, market makers. So more environmental regulations, more regulations in general are good for cryptocurrencies as well as they're good for the markets uh, more broadly. Uh, so relate, I'm uh, almost at a follow-up uh, question. Like there, there was also a reaction some that you mentioned that the more regulation uh, of uh, cryptocurrencies the better. So the question, like what 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 specific types of regulation you think will be introduced in, in the kind of in the coming future? What central banks can be thinking of, and what types of regulation you think can be like good uh, for the for the development of cryptocurrencies. So, so let me may, maybe make them, rank them in some order, which I think is important. So the first and foremost uh, regulation, which are already uh, being in place, are regulations related to know your customer and uh, to the illegal use of cryptocurrencies. So what's bad for cryptocurrencies is when it's used to finance you know, terrorism, to uh, finance you know, drug purchases, illegal activity, and so on. So anything that forces companies, forces consumers to know your customer, to bring this activity above the ground, it's going to be good for the cryptocurrencies uh, as, uh, as an asset class in general. Second, regulations related to cryptocurrencies as an asset class. How do you custody the assets? How do you make sure that you know, if a grandma from I Iowa buys Bitcoin and then she forgets the, uh, the code for it, how it can be recovered uh, if she goes to the local bank. So anything like this, but at the level say of the companies is, is important. One thing I think we will see reasonably soon 
is the issue of um, at least some of the cryptocurrency industries uh, doing parallel work to the payment systems and to the banks. So think about all of the uh, regulations that came out of the shadow banking system in China, of the person-to-person uh, -person payments and so on and so on, how worried the regulators were. So I think the regulators that affect the cryptocurrencies, which deal with the financial, uh, with the financial sector, which deal with the banking, which deal with payment systems, those are going to be very important. We'll see them, them uh, relatively soon, relatively soon in the, in the future. Uh, so I guess there, there's also a couple of questions that I'm almost clarifying, but uh, to uh, and uh, but uh, it would be good uh, if you answer fully that uh, about one specific uh, kind of feature that uh, makes them closer to money, I mean as a payment uh, as a means of payment. So what's like? Do you think it's uh, it has any future, especially like of private cryptocurrency, especially given? Uh, the entry of the central banks on the scene uh, that we just uh, discussed. Is there any uh, kind of hope <laughs> for the prior to, yeah, so, to survive as a means of payment? So, so uh, that, that's, that's a good question. So I, I don't know the, the answer fully to this, but um, let's think about the means of payment. So there is, uh, you know, there is US dollar, so which is a mean of payment, but there are also credit cards. Credit cards are easy and useful and the uh, the easy and useful for a variety of circumstances, even though where you can, uh, you can uh, pay dollars. For big things, you use the bank, and tr the bank transactions. So uh, the question is not about whether the um, traditional currencies, traditional digital currencies are gonna drive out cryptocurrencies, but what's gonna happen with the intermediaries? And I think what one interesting thing is gonna happen is that we will see the birth of new ways how to transfer money, the new ways how to pay for goods and services that may be denominated in dollar, but may be using uh, um, cryptocurrencies. So let me give you an example. So if you travel, uh, every time you withdraw money uh, and convert say dollars to, to euro, so you get something like 2.5% commission, even with a big bank, like Bank of America or something like this. So this is preposterous. This is just giant, uh, the giant transaction fees, remittances. So in fact, a bunch of economists in the world uh, are run on remittances. So migrant workers go and work somewhere and they send money back home. Sometimes it costs as much as 20% to send those, especially on small transactions. Uh, payday loans, many other things which uh, are about efficiency of the payment system. I think that's where it's gonna be first and tangible role for cryptocurrencies, even though in the end, they may be denominated in, in dollars. Sorry. Uh, so the uh, question from, uh, from Zoom is that, uh, what are the incentives of the of new cryptocurrencies? Basically, because you, if I understand correctly, you under, you you analyze portfolio of cryptocurrencies, but it's like a fixed portfolio, or, or I didn't get it fully. But there were also entry and exit of of different cryptocurrencies, and there are clearly some incentives for entry and exit. And uh, entry and exit obviously has some spillover effects on other cryptocurrencies. So if you analyze the market for cryptocurrencies and and entry and exit there. What are the predictions of well, like the, what, what uh, kind of cryptocurrency will survive, will be growing exponentially the number, et cetera, like this, this uh, approach? Yeah, so what we have done is, so in fact, since we analyzed uh, the market back from 2011 or 2012, uh, uh, but you know this data is from 2014 because there is a sizable number of cryptocurrencies to analyze. So there were many, uh, there were much fewer cryptocurrencies back then. So what you do is when you create an index, you essentially add new currencies and you reweigh the old uh, cryptocurrencies to make a consistent, consistent index. So now there are 18, 1800 currencies. You know, a few years ago, there were maybe hundred currencies with uh, this, this kind of capitalization. And you know, 20 years ago, there were none. So hence there was no, no index. So you have to reweigh, and actually that's, that's a little bit of an art of how to do this index, but it's not, it's not, uh, not rocket science. In terms of the entry of the cryptocurrency, I mean, there are many, many areas which are ripe for disruption. 
So again, the example I give is the beginning of uh, internet. I mean, who would have guessed that uh, uh, Harvard's, uh, um, you know, it was not, 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 it was not even a social network. It was, I don't know, like the, uh, the Facebook was literally the book of faces would become one of the ways how uh, people communicate or the filtering application uh, become the equivalent of uh, TV for modern generation or TikTok, right? Things like this. So it's hard to predict where the disruption is going to be. And it can come from uh, the, um, the places which are hard to predict. But I already can tell you that there are a bunch of boring, mundane, uninteresting, zero hype industries where blockchain and cryptocurrencies as uh, the um, realization of the blockchain are making very big, very big strides. So one is payment system. The second is all kinds of things related to logistics, because so for example, for container shipping, the whole system of the documents, uh, bill, bills of laden and so on and so on, this is just you know, hugely, hugely inefficient. And we'll see many other things, you know, file storage, peer-to-peer uh, -peer landing, and many others where we'll see the uh, incentives to enter, be, enter to because the, um, there is possibility of, this, of uh, disruption. The um, point I often make when I talk to large corporations about cryptocurrencies is the following, is that now if you are in a business which may have blockchain application, and if you don't have a blockchain plan or cryptocurrency plan more broadly, this is the same thing as if you are a retailer in you know, 2000 and you didn't have a plan how to how to deal with the, with the online retailer. So I think we'll, we will see uh, at least some industries fundamentally disrupted by cryptocurrencies. So the next question is more like, is really macroeconomic, uh, meaning, uh, meaning how on the relationship between the market for cryptocurrencies and the monetary supply, et cetera. So basically is how uh, the involvement of the market for cryptocurrency can inflate, for example, like inflation in a, in a country and whether actually, like, well, I, I won't talk about that, whether it actually the development of market for cryptocurrencies, will it affect how central banks are able who influence actually inflation or on the mechanism that central banks uh, are using, are they a threat or will they be effective? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So, um, so, so far we, and we have done this. In fact, I have just updated this for, for this talk. So far, we do not see any impact on the price of cryptocurrencies on inflation. I'm sure there is no, no, no other way around. No other things that potentially drive inflationary expectations we see very low, actually we see no, no effect. Maybe it's because we lived in the low inflation environment in the world broadly for so long. Uh, maybe it's gonna be different for the um, emerging market economies, but for so far we have not seen any of this evidence. Theoretically, of course, if the money supply is higher, well, there may be certainly effects on the monetary policy. In addition to this, they made monetary supply, which is not, uh, controlled by the central bank. But the modern central banking is more about the interest rates and about setting interest rates. And again, because of the arbitrage uh, reasons, I think they're going to be, uh, it's going to be difficult to change the dominance of uh, the Fed or ECB in the near future. In 20 years, it may be the case. But again, looking at what happened in the US prior to the Fed and after the Fed, I think that uh, that's, um, I don't see the, the major, major impact uh, in the near future. What I think the central bank should be worried about is the cryptocurrencies related to the financial sector, uh, in particular to, uh, to the whole system of the shadow banking, the whole system of the quasi-financial and quasi-banking institutions that arise. I think that's going to be a more immediate danger for the monetary policy, for the financial, actually in particular more for financial stability policy. That's what, what that's, if I were a central banker, that's what I would worry more about rather than about the instruments of the monetary policy. Great, great. Uh, so the next question from Zoom is, um, 
uh, a bit more detail on the analysis of heterogeneity across cryptocurrencies. So this factor that you're describing and the, the, uh, the behavior of them, how many of them, like, uh, can you tell a little bit more about the, uh, what maybe there are some features that are driven entirely by, uh, by big, uh, big uh, crypto like Bitcoin or it's more general phenomenon? Yeah, so, um, so one thing uh, which is interesting to do, in fact, where we're doing now is, uh, uh, and that's a natural next step in, in asset pricing, is to try to classify cryptocurrencies by industries. And it's an interesting question because you have to classify not them just by the product, but also by the technical nature of them. And it turns out if you have this uh, crypto classification we'll called the standard crypto classification, it's not published yet, uh, but it's, uh, um, we actually see that many of the industries or many of the companies or many of the cryptocurrencies within industries, they, they certainly co-move together. And at the industry level, they may be certainly different, driven by different loadings. So loadings on momentum, loadings on size, depending on the industry. So it's a, it's a very, very rich uh, figure, but it's not that dissimilar from other asset classes. For example, if you look at uh, the financial industry uh, uh, and the equity for stocks and financial industry versus stocks for, for chemicals. So they are driven by you know, somewhat different uh, factors and certainly by different loadings of the factors, but uh, uh, broadly the, uh, the same structure, the overall structure of the risk return characteristics uh, stays the same. Another question is, um... Uh, it, uh, kind of potential interpretation of your fact number three that uh, the supply side almost doesn't matter and uh, it's all basically on the like, demand side is uh, is uh, is the one. So and uh, the, one of the potential applications that there's two different co concepts like proof of work and proof of stake currencies they seem to be like almost equivalent. Uh, although I mean, they look like a very different beast. So is it true to have a look at the internal of heterogeneity because between the, uh, the currencies, have you separated these two types and if do they really behave differently? Yeah, so we did, we did basically everything, uh, maybe, maybe I'll learn something from, from the chat, but pretty much everything that one could have thought about we've done. So in particular, we did indeed separated the, the, these two types of cryptocurrencies. We also have separated in many more uh, finer technological details. They do behave somewhat, somewhat differently, and there are interesting, interesting things uh, there in terms of the, the the technology. I mean, one thing we we see is that it seems that the industry, or it seems that the currencies, we, we, the primary role of which are being smart contracts, so they behave differently from uh, just the normal uh, cryptocurrencies. The role of which is being the unit of account or the mean of exchange. So, but uh, there are many more uh, very fine details. We haven't, you know, put all of them together yet, but that's uh, certainly some of the some of the things we actually do know, and some of the things which are on the agenda. And that's actually something quite interesting because the um, the cryptocurrencies you are able to see right away the technological differences immediately as opposed to say, creating for stocks. You know, what's the difference in technology between say Amazon and Microsoft? It's much more difficult to construct, but you're, it's more visible in terms of the, uh, the technological structure of cryptocurrencies. Okay. So uh, another question is uh, kind of related to ESG question that I asked, but in different levels. So that uh, since, it's, again, it's uh, so much uh, related to environment, uh, in this zoo of factors, was there anything that actually related to environmental uh, stuff that was, can be co potentially correlated to uh, the cryptocurrencies. So, so actually, so that, that's actually a very good question. So my impression was, and the people can uh, correct me, that um, so the, in equity pricing, I think the recent work at least put some, cast some doubt. For example, that there is the uh, premium for the environmentally, uh, environmentally good companies. I don't know how good this research is, but at least there is some evidence. So there is no direct environmental stuff in the, in the factor zoo, but I guarantee you that you can construct the ESG portfolio or the ESG predictability from, from these factors. So we have not done this, actually it's probably easy to, to check you know, almost uh, you know, in a couple of hours whether any of these ESG-like factors are gonna 
um, drive the, the price of the cryptocurrencies or the price of the equities. Oh, yeah, well, I guess like there's a word that I'm in IT by Roberto Bhagavan uh, that basically says that all these measures of ESG are like, completely uncorrelated to those which, so we don't know uh, what is ESG, so maybe that's why, why we don't have observed any relation. And it'd be interesting if actually we can use Bitcoins or whatever uh, to, to actually reconstruct this kind of metal issues the, the other way around. But that's kind For of... For example, uh, <laughs> the long-run value. The so one of the yeah. things about climate is that it's a very long-run long thing. So like the long-run impact and uh, the, the the long-term things, which are actually something that people argue that maybe dri driving the like the probability of disaster, for example, the environmental disasters, they may be driving even the asset price today, but they're very difficult to measure. Okay, so another question again, that uh, one, one, one of the um, kind of clear kind of uh, uh, features of uh, a lot of the script and cryptocurrencies is that alone, not in the portfolio, but alone, they have very high volatility. And do you think it's a temporary uh, temporary phenomenon that's because it's a growing market, it's not an immature market and it will go away in the future, or it's like a really a feature of some of this uh, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin style currencies that will remain with them even when the market develops? Yeah, so what are you seeing that volatility is declining? So compared to the early days of cryptocurrency, one, uh, if you look, for example, at gold after the uh, rescind, uh, rescinding of the gold standard, gold was very volatile as well, maybe even as volatile as cryptocurrency. And then now to, you know, one of the assets, which is uh, the clear store of value. So I think it's going to normalize whether it's going to be as uh, little or as volatile as stocks. I don't know how long it will take. I don't know. But volatility is good because volatility speeds time in a sense, so it's like condenses time. So uh, given the returns, so what's, what's more important is returns to volatility ratio, which is the sharp ratio, and that's not widely different from, uh, from, the, from the stocks. Okay, great, so I'm afraid we ran out of time because I am for with amazing lectures and uh, tons of questions and you know, this topic, uh, but we need to challenge an important tool. <laughs> Uh, skill. So we have to wrap up and uh, I would really like to thank everyone for coming and especially uh, Alec for making such an amazing uh, uh, giving us such an amazing lecture so Paul who answered the questions and I'm really glad, glad to announce uh, the, the price for the best question of uh, the bookmark uh, promo code will go to Dagia Timakova uh, who asked the question about the effect of uh, currencies on inflation uh, in, uh, in, uh, as a macro phenomenon. So, Dagi, please uh, write to us and you will receive this uh, wonderful subscription to, to the book bag. Uh, meanwhile, I would really like to thank one more time Oleg, uh, our partners who are from uh, Rosso Silfos Bank who helped us to organize this uh, lecture and everyone who participated and asked questions. Thank you very much. We're finishing this lecture.